everybody again to the eighth anatomy tutoring session. We're very glad to have you here. Uh, the only housekeeping that I have for today is that we've got two weeks of registration left open. We have about 650 registrants so far, so that number keeps growing and we're getting a lot more people from the West Coast coming in and joining us, which is awesome. Very glad to have everyone there. Um, so if you have any other friends or peers that you think would be interested in competing, um, adding this experience to their resume, um, please encourage them to join us. We're happy to have them. So with that, I'll turn things over to Dr. Bill Frank to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome back. Um, our first presenter is Kate Long LeJoy. Uh, she's going to be presenting on the anatomy of the urinary and reproductive systems. Kate graduated from Johns Hopkins University with a bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering and subsequently earned a master's degree from Georgetown University in biophysics and physiology. She now attends Drexel University College of Medicine. When not studying, Kate loves to travel the world with her husband, Mike, always returning home to her rambunctious pup, Lily. Kate believes that the the learning of anatomy is like discovering a roadmap of all the fascinating structures that enable us to live and do what we love. So with that, I will open this up for Kate. Thank you, Dr. Frank. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Let me share my screen. Um, I actually don't think I have that capability. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? It's just, just taking a minute to load, Kate. Okay. Um, if someone could just let me know when the uh, first screen appears, that would be great. Maybe try refreshing. Let's try that. Okay, let's try that. There we awesome. go. We, we're good. All right. So I will be discussing the anatomy, anatomy of the urinary and reproductive systems today. And there we go. I'm going to go through the lecture objectives just briefly so we can touch upon um, the things that you need to know. Um, so the first is to identify the organs from kidney to external urethra and the functions of the urinary system. Explain differences in urinary system between the anatomy of individuals assigned male and female at birth. Describe the anatomical structure of the breast, including its relation to the skin, superficial fascia, and pectoral muscles. And lastly, describe the function of the male and female reproductive systems, as well as major anatomical components of each. Okay, so the urinary system anatomy. Uh, let's start with the kidneys. There are two kidneys, one on each side of your body. The right kidney sits a little bit lower than the left because your liver is on the right side of your body. Um, can everyone see my cursor? Okay, so the liver would kind of fall here in um, a triangle. So you can see that the right kidney does sit lower. And remember that when you're looking at um, images or photos of the body, the right and left side are generally reversed. It's very rare that you see an image from the posterior to the anterior. So it generally is right on the left, left on the right. The function of the kidneys is to filter blood supplied by the renal arteries to remove unwanted substances and secrete waste into the urine. And there are quite a few structures within the kidneys. Um, there, it's a very complex process. It's very intricately refined um, and it helps your body maintain its homeostasis in terms of electrolyte balance, um, filtering out again, any unwanted substances, toxic substances, and those can be then excreted into the urine. Oops. The urine then is filtered into the ureter. Again, there are two because there are two kidneys, one ureter for each kidney. The ureters are long, thin tubes of smooth muscle. Contractions of the smooth muscle push urine through the ureters and into the bladder, which is down here. In adults, the ureters are about 25 to 30 centimeters long, and you can say, see that they do stretch quite a ways from the kidney to the bladder. Hey, Kate, before you, um, do you want to go back to that slide? Why don't you just show everyone where the renal arteries are and just mention what it is they branch off of. 
Okay, so this is the um, abdominal aorta here, this large structure. It's right um, in the very, well, it's almost in the very center of the body. It sits slightly to the left um, of the vertebral column, but for your purposes, we can call it in the center of the body. There are two branches, the, the left renal artery into the left kidney here. Um, again, following the red structure, you can see that it is behind the blue, which is representing the vein. And then the right renal artery is quite hidden in this image, but you can imagine it goes, um, again, from the abdominal aorta down into the left, sorry, right kidney. So now the, the urine is in the bladder. There is only one bladder, singular structure, so it is approximately in the middle of the um, body, the midline of the body, rather. The wall of the bladder contains folds called rugae and a layer of smooth muscle called the detrusor muscle. Um, and you can see the detrusal muscle here is um, depicted by this kind of cobblestone appearance. But again, uh, you are familiar with the structure of smooth muscle because we went through that in a previous lecture. And if not, feel free to go back and, and review that. Um, as the urine fills the bladder, the rugae smooth out to accommodate the volume, so the bladder stretches and becomes larger. The detrusor relaxes to hold the urine, and then when it's time to urinate, um, the detrusor muscle contracts, the bladder gets smaller, and the urine is pushed down through this internal urethral sphincter. Um, there are also some pretty cool microscopic um, elements to the bladder wall. Uh, the, the epithelium is transitional epithelium, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the second section, but there are definitely a few mechanisms that allow for that bladder to expand and accommodate um, varying volumes of urine. Um, once the urine passes through the internal urethra sphincter, it is in the urethra. Again, there's only one because it's coming out of the bladder and there's only one bladder. The urine collects in the bladder and is then excreted through the urethra as the detruso muscle um, contracts. So there are a few differences in anatomy between the female and male urinary system. Uh, the male bladder sits in front of the rectum and above the prostate gland. So you can see the prostate gland is this yellowy structure here, and the bladder is represented by this um, white structure. I, I would say striated, but I don't want to say that. But it's this like zebra stripe structure in this diagram. Um, and you can uh, see that it is. Oh, I got a bit of an echo. Is everyone still hearing me okay? Okay, so we're in front of the rectum, which is represented in this diagram here. The female bladder is located in front of the vagina and below the uterus. And its proximity and location to the uterus, as you can imagine, um, if you were to become pregnant, the uterus is growing with a fetus and it is pressing down on that bladder, which is why you've probably often heard that when you're pregnant, you do need to urinate quite frequently. Another difference between the male and female urinary system is the urethra. The female urethra is narrow, about four centimeters long, which is significantly shorter than the males, and extends from the bladder neck to the external urethral orifice in the vest vestibule of the vagina. And I do have a picture of the vestibule a little bit later on. The male urethra is about 17.5 to 20 centimeters and is divided into three sections. It extends from the bladder neck through the prostrate and the penis to the external urethral orifice, which is the same external urethral orifice that is existent in both male and female. In men, both urine and semen pass out of the body through the urethra, so it kind of has a dual functionality there. And the three sections to the urethra in males is the prostatic urethra, which as you can guess, passes through the prostate, the membranous urethra, which is the narrowest portion of the urethra, and then the spongy urethra is the last portion, and that is the longest portion of the urethra. And that is, let's see, the spongy urethra is here and it travels all the way down to the very external urethral orifice. So this is a little bit of a clinical information, clinical pearl, but again, we discussed that the female urethra is shorter than the male and it's closer in proximity to the anus. And we can think for a second, why might this be important? So bacteria that naturally colonize the digestive tract can more easily make their way from the exterior to the external urethral orifice from the anus. Additionally, bacteria that do make their way to the urethral orifice have a shorter path to traverse to the bladder in females. So you can see here, the urethra is quite short. And if bacteria were to make it to the external urethral orifice, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump right into the bladder, which can be a little bit problematic because it does lead to urinary tract infections. 
which are much more common in females than in males. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit to talk about uh, the anatomy of the breast. The breast is composed of mammary glands surrounded by a connective tissue stroma and encapsulated by fascia. The mammary glands are modified sweat glands, so they're a series of ducts and secretory lobules. Each lobule consists of many alveoli drained by a single lactiferous duct, which then converge at the nipple. So you can see the lactiferous ducts here represented by these blue structures connecting the alveoli, these budding structures to the central nipple. The connective tissue stroma has a fibrous and a fatty component, and you can see that represented here. You can see some um, fat in the breast as well as the suspensory ligaments, which are the fibrous portion. Um, the fibrous stroma consents to form the suspensory ligaments of Cooper, and that just adds support to the breast um, Obviously, gravity does take a toll over the course of a lifetime. The, uh, you know, the, the connective tissue does eventually lose some of that um, elastic collagen, and it does eventually um, fall a little bit. But the suspensory ligaments of Cooper do protect the breast from um, falling too much. It does add structure to the breast. Superficial fascia. Uh, lays below the skin, and a deeper layer lays above the pectoral fascia. So the pectoral muscle is right behind the breast here. The superficial layer of the superficial fascia, this can be a little bit confusing, lies on the outside of the breast, and the deep layer of the superficial fascia lies behind the breast right in front of the pectoral muscle. The pectoral, oops, sorry about that. The pectoral fascia, um, Below the deep layer of the superficial fascia lays the pectoral fascia, which is associated with the pectoralis major muscle. And when we say associated with, it's very closely associated. It's laying right on the surface of that muscle. So we have the deep layer of the superficial fascia, the pectoral fascia, and then the pectoralis major muscle right below that. The functions of the female reproductive system will be discussed next. The female reproductive system is responsible for several different things, um, among which are producing gametes called eggs or ova. They produce certain sex hormones that help your body develop secondary sexual characteristics, as well as carry out um, a number of um, necessary functions to maintain that population of eggs, develop one egg every month. Um, and ovulate that egg, as well as maintain the uterus in an environment that is um, beneficial and, and functional for hosting an egg should it be fertilized. It also maintains the fertilized eggs as they develop into mature fetuses and become ready for delivery. The internal anatomy of the female reproductive system is depicted here. Um, we have the ovaries right here, one on each side. These contain the female sex cells, the gametes, um, and they develop in the ovaries. And you can see those depicted here by these little circles with um, smaller circles inside, which are follicles with a developing ovum inside. The fallopian tube is this structure here, again, one on each side. And there's a few different structures that make up the fallopian tube. Um, they're not... Um, distinct from one another. They do transition quite seamlessly into one another, but we do kind of separate them based on uh, function or certain complications. So for example, the fimbrae are these finger-like projections here, uh, and the ovary is not actually connected to the fallopian tube. So when the oocyte is ovulated into the peritoneal cavity, the fimbrae actually kind of bring that egg into the fallopian tube. Next, you have the infundibulum here which is between the fimbrae and the ampulla. The ampulla is of importance clinically, especially because if you were to have an ectopic pregnancy, that is the most likely source or site of that pregnancy. And if we break it down, ectopic just means um, where something shouldn't be or where it shouldn't occur. So if we have an ectopic pregnancy that should take place in the uterus, um, it just means that it's not happening where it should. So in this case, it would generally happen around here in the ampulla of the fallopian tube. And then we have the isthmus, which is where the fallopian tube opens up into the uterus. The uterus has three different linings, uh, the peritoneum, the myometrium, sorry, perimetrium, not peritoneum, want to make that clear, that was my mistake, per, uh, perimetrium, myometrium, and endometrium. The perimetrium is 
closest to the outside of the organ. The myometrium is right in between. And then the endometrium is the very innermost layer. And that is what sheds each month with menstruation. Then we have the cervix of the uterus down here. Um, this picture shows the fundus as the head of the uterus. I didn't label that, but it is labeled in the um, image here. And then we have the body or the corpus. The vagina is right below the cervix, and that is the fibromuscular tube that extends from the cervix of the uterus to the outside environment. It is located between the rectum and the urinary bladder, and it serves as a passageway for menstrual flow, receives the penis during intercourse, and as the birth canal during childbirth. So again, it has a few different functions, but these functions generally occur at different uh, times. We have the external anatomy of the female reproductive system labeled here, and I didn't have any written um, descriptions of where they were located because I thought this picture did a really nice job of explaining where everyone was, everything was located. Uh, so we have the preface right at, at the top of the vagina. Um, the glans clitoris, which is located right below the prepuce. The labia minora are these folds of skin um, that are between the labia majora and the vaginal canal. Um, they are kind of difficult to see here, but there's one there and there's one here. The labia majora is labeled down here, and those the thick keratinized skin um, on the outside, there are two larger folds on the outside of the vagina um, being pulled away by the fingers in this photo so that we can see the internal structures. Um, we have the corpus cavernosum and the, well, the corpus cavernosum are these two structures that you do not see from an external point of view, but they are located right below the surface and they do connect the glans clitoris. Um, the urethral opening is here, right below the glans clitoris and the vaginal opening. And the vaginal opening itself is located down here, um, posterior to most other structures. This is really important um, if you were to think of giving a catheter. You do not want to contaminate a sterile catheter by putting it in the vaginal opening where there's a lot of bacteria and flora naturally occurring bacteria and flora, and then try to reinsert it into the urethra. That is a recipe for a UTI. Um, you want to make sure that you know where the urethral opening is when you're performing a catheterization so that you don't uh, contaminate the urethra with those exogenous flora. Here's some additional photos that I included just for your reference if you wanted to go back and take a look at these slides. Um, Again, this photo shows a better representation of where the pectoralis muscle is. I know that it wasn't included in the previous photo, so you can take a look at that here. Um, we have a side or an, um, lateral view of the female internal anatomy. So you can kind of see where the fimbrae and fallopian tube is associated with the ovary and the uterus. And then just another representation of external female genitalia. So switching gears to the male reproductive system, the male reproductive system is responsible for producing androgens such as testosterone that maintain the male reproductive functions. And it promotes spermatogenesis and transport into the female reproductive system for fertilization. So if we travel with the sperm from spermatogenesis to um, ejaculation during um, sexual intercourse to you know, in an attempt to get an egg fertilized. Um, we start in the testes with the spermatogenesis, and this is also where testosterone is produced. And again, that testosterone doesn't just help with um, the maturation of sperm. It also is responsible for those secondary sex characteristics, um, like deepening voice, hair under the armpits, um, axilla, and in the pubic region, um, among other functions. Uh, the epididymis is used as a storage system for the sperm, and it allows the sperm to mature. Vas deferens then transport the mature sperm from the epididymis to the ejaculatory duct, which delivers sperm into the urethra and adds secretions from the prostate. And then we have the urethra, again, divided into three parts, the prostatic urethra, which flows through the um, prostate, the membranous urethra, again, the narrowest portion of the urethra, and then the spongy urethra, the longest portion, which travels all the way 
down here. And those are labeled pretty well here. The 11 is the spongiosum, the corpus spongiosum is the spongiurethra, and that travels all the way down. And then we have seven, this tiny guy here is labeled on the next slide, but okay. So focusing on the glands now, you have the prostate gland, which is here, this purple structure. Um, it's about the size of a walnut um, when it's in the shell. So it's not, it's not very large, but it is enough that if it were to grow, um, given you know cancer or benign prostatic hyperplasia, you can imagine it might compress the urethra there and you are lined up for a few different um, issues with urination. The prostate glands produce portion of the seminal fluid that is enriched in zinc, and it contributes to the alkalinity of semen that helps neutralize the acidity of the vaginal tract. So the, the vagina is a pretty acidic environment, but that can also be problematic when you have sperm trying to traverse the vagina into the uterus. And the alkalinity of the semen just helps protect those, semen, those sperm so that they can get to the uterus um, unharmed. We have the seminal vesicles, which are labeled five here as vesicular glands. There are a few different names for this. Um, so you might see it seminal vesicles, you might see it vesicular glands, um, and that is right here. And then lastly, we have the Cowper's gland, which is labeled seven, this little guy, it's easy, easy to miss, um, but it is between the prostatic urethra and the membranous urethra. And that produces a, quick, a thick, clear mucus um, prior to ejaculation that drains into the spongy urethra. And I'm, I'm sorry, I did skip this, but the vesicular glands or the seminal vesicles produce the majority of the fluid volume wise that makes up the semen and it metabolically supports the sperm. So it gives it the nutrients it needs to survive. And this slide I copied from the very first session. So um, this is exactly the slide it was in the very first tutoring session, if you wanted to go take a look at this. But I thought this did a nice job of um, putting the, the glands in order of where they would be seen from testes to urethra as the sperm were to travel from testes to urethra. So if you wanted more information on this, um, feel free to revert back to that very first tutoring session. Um, and I believe it was in the third section of that first tutoring section. And I think that concludes my slides. So do we have any questions? Kate, if you can go back, um, there was a question in the chat just asking uh, for more clarification about the location of the membranous urethra in males. And, you know, I I'll let yeah. you I'll let you show that and describe it, and then I'll throw in my two cents worth if I need to. Okay, so the membranous urethra is the narrowest portion of the urethra, again, between the prostate and the spongy. And I believe it is just this section here right between the prostate and the spongy urethra. So it is very small, and the reason it has its own name is because it has its own characteristics. So, you know, just because it's small doesn't mean it's not important. Again, it's the narrowest portion that could influence some clinical um, characteristics as well as, um, you know, have some different um, epithelial and, and histological characteristics. Dr. Frank, anything you want to add before I throw in my two cents worth? Nope, I'm, I'm curious to see what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess it, it's a little bit complicated, um, and, and this was Michael that um, asked this question, but we'll, we'll try to very quickly um, give you the most straightforward answer. So we have something called a pelvic diaphragm or a pelvic floor, and they're, they're not actually equivalent. But for the purposes of the anatomy, let's just say that that membranous urethra is really that very short segment that is transitioning from an organ within the pelvic cavity. It brings the urethra through the pelvic floor, and then you're into the spongy urethra, which is actually making its way through the penis. So now you're, you're externally located outside of the body cavity. All right, I gave it my best shot. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Let's see, do we have any other questions? We do. Um, how do the vesicular glands specifically support the sperm? 
Okay, well, I can touch on this um, to some extent, but the sperm are very motile creatures. Creatures is not the right word. They're very motile cells. Um, they have a flagella that propels them to where they need to get. And you can imagine with that much motion, that much energy, um, they are going to need something to support that metabolically. Um, nothing comes for free. You need something to provide that energy for motility. So they do have um, quite a few different um, components to the vesicular gland or seminal vesicle fluid that do provide that energy for the sperm to move. But I'm sure that Dr. Frank can do a bit of a better job explaining specifically. Well, you're, you're correct that it does have a lot of fructose because it's going to support the sperm. It also has prostaglandins and some other things. Um, but uh, it produces the seminal fluid, which is the major component of semen. And again, it contains elements necessary for nourishment and the transport of the sperm cells uh, during ejaculation. So I think you were pretty right on. Dr. Peterson, anything else? I'm not sure if the histology um, presentation will bring this up. And this is, again, just sort of for your own edification. Um, but we have um, contributions from the, the seminal vesicles that actually kind of coagulate, meaning help to clump the semen um, when it's deposited. And then the prostate actually produces some anticoagulants that will release the spermatozoa from the seminal fluid after several hours being within the, the vaginal tract. So um, it's there to maintain, the coagulating factors are there to maintain the spermatozoa within the vagina, give them a long enough period of time where they become more activated than the anticoagulants that are also in the seminal fluid from the prostate glands allow them to get to begin their 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 motility, their swimming journey towards the oocyte in the fallopian tube. And I do believe Michael has a question. Michael, you can go ahead. Yeah, I had, uh, uh, I guess, two questions. One was like, for when the one muscle in the bladder is contracting, is there like a valve or um, something that stops the urine from going back up into the ureters? Um, something like that. And that, that was my first. And the second would be like, what, what kind of different histological uh, parts of like the tissue between those uh, different urethras going through, but yeah. So, oh, am I muted? Let's see. Good. I'm in trouble. Okay, I'm not muted. Um, so the ureters enter the bladder um, inferiorly here at the ureteric openings. Um, what you're describing is um, like reflux back up the ureters, I think. Um, that's actually a great question. So, Kate, maybe I should jump in just yeah, a that'd bit. that'd be great. <laughs> Get you started, and then you can follow up with what I say. So the ureters actually kind of hook. They come from above where the kidneys are, and gravity is helping along with smooth muscle contractions in the wall of the ureters to bring that urine and they're angled on the posterior surface of the bladder so that they're actually coming in. And it's as the bladder is filling then, it actually helps to compress the openings of the ureters and prevent some of that, that um, urine reflux, as is gravity, et cetera. So that's, there's no real valve there. Sometimes it's almost referred to as like a physiological sphincter, meaning there's not an actual sphincter. It's just in the orientation of their entry and the thickness of the smooth muscle in the wall of the bladder. That's all I got, Kate. I love it. Physiological sphincter. Makes sense. Hey. Yes, I agree. It is super cool. <laughs> so do we have any more questions for Kate? 
I know some of the histology things, Mackenzie's going to do the next block. And if she doesn't touch on it there, then please ask again and we'll try to hit it there if you have something more specific on the histology of this region. It looks like that might be our last question. It looks like it. So I'll have you uh, unshare. And thank you again, Kate. You've this is what your third or fourth? This is my uh, third. Third. Yep. Okay. So we thank you very, very much for all of your uh, help and contribution. It's very, very helpful. So thank you. Yeah, all right. Fun. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Did we have another question from Michael. I just want to make oh, sure before. Michael, did you still have oh, your hand yeah, up? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, I was just curious as far as this alveoli, um, does that have some sort of meaning? Like, You're kind of breaking up, Michael. Just, yeah, he's wondering if that has he's asking effect. about the alveoli, Kate, in the breast tissue, and if that has any sort of um, anatomical uh meaning and and I guess I would say alveoli or just alveoli it's just the the you know the cluster like shape of the actual glandular portion the secretory portion Michael of the mammary glands and they're actually modified sweat glands actually so Okay. Okay, Michael, so we will move on. So our next presenter is Mackenzie uh, Blackstock. She's going to be presenting the histology of the urinary and reproductive systems. Mackenzie is from Orlando, Florida and graduated from Auburn University with a bachelor's degree in animal science and earned a master's degree from Vanderbilt University in biomedical sciences. She is currently a second year student at the Everett Via College of Osteopathic Medicine in Auburn. When not studying, Mackenzie loves spending time with her husband, Cole, and her dog, Winchester. She loves to cook. Taylor Swift, and I apologize, we are taking you away from the Kansas City game. So we really appreciate your sacrifice here this evening. <laughs> um, uh, but I... Uh, she is also an avid equestrian. So Mackenzie's favorite part of anatomy is the gastrointestinal anatomy. So without further ado, Mackenzie. Well, hello everybody. If you guys could just give me confirmation that you can hear me and you can see my screen and we will go ahead and get started talking about the histology of the urinary and reproductive systems. So here are our brief lecture objectives. So we're going to describe the microstructure of the ureter, the urinary bladder, urethra, and the urethra, and correlate these with their location and function. We'll describe the gross histological organization of the ovary, compare the histological histology and function of the three layers of the uterine wall, and also describe the microscopic organization of the testes and correlate that with its function. So just to give a quick shout out to our first tutor, uh, Kate did a wonderful job giving us a anatomy review of these systems. Um, you guys are not responsible for histology of the kidney, but that is something that you guys can look forward to uh, in your undergraduate education. And so we will be focusing predominantly on the ureters, the bladder and the urethra. So to start off the ureter histology, um, our ureter is composed of three layers. There's an outer adventitia, which is composed of a fibrous connective tissue, which anchors the ureter to the posterior abdominal wall and houses blood vessels to nourish these ureteric cells. There is a middle muscularis, which is right here, that is layers of smooth muscle, which function to propel urine into the bladder. And then an inner mucosa, which surrounds the lumen and is lined by a transitional epithelium. And this inner mucosa functions to secrete mucus, which allows expansion and contraction for urine to pass through. 
And then here is the histological representation of those three layers correlated with their numbers on this uh, kind of wide view image. And now looking at our urinary bladder, the wall of the urinary bladder is similar to the ureter, except we have some of these exceptions here. The superior surface of the bladder is covered by a serosa, which is made up of mesothelium and loose connective tissue. The outer walls of the bladder are covered by an adventitia. And then this muscularis layer is thicker and it contains three layers of smooth muscle. It has an inner and outer longitudinal layer as well as a middle circular layer. However, the mucosa is the same as the ureter, which is transitional epithelium, but you'll commonly see it referred to as urethelium. And then here you can see those different layers on this um, drawing depiction of the histology on the left right here. Now for identifying the different types of transitional epithelium, this is just a quick review of your stratified squamous epithelium right here. So it has a flattened outermost layer and then many other layers below it. And then for our different, so you can compare your stratified squamous epithelium to the differences in your transitional epithelium, which are gonna be over on the right of the slide. And you have stretched and distended transitional epithelium, which is depicted here. So it has a flattened outermost layer, but it has few cell layers. And this reflects the function of the bladder, which spreads out these cells because it has to grow in volume. And then you also have unstretched and relaxed transitional epithelium, which has many different shapes within it, this outermost layer, and it has many layers, but still less than your stratified squamous epithelium. And these two layers for or these two different types of transitional epithelium where stretched or unstretched, they can look very similar on histology. And a good way to differentiate is you have these balloon cells in your unstretched epithelium, which you can see here with this yellow uh, rectangle to kind of help you get a good grasp on differentiating the two. Now for the female urethra histology, um, the mucosa, it will vary greatly. Um, and you have longitudinal folds and urethral glands that are visible histologically. And then in terms of a muscularis layer, you have longitudinal and circular layers of smooth muscle. However, there is no clear adventitia. And to do another quick anatomy review of the male urethra, there is your three parts that you guys have covered in the last time frame. Um, you have your prostatic, your membranous and your spongy. So the color boxes correlate over here to the different portions. And now we're gonna jump into the histology of the different urethras. And so your prostatic urethra is transitional epithelium resting on a lamina propria, which contains urethral glands. And then you also have a, mem your membranous urethra is pseudostratified columnar epithelial. And you have skeletal muscle present at the level of your external urethral sphincter. And then you also have bulbal urethral glands present. And so here is a histological representation of your prostatic urethra. And then down here is the histological representation of your spongy urethra. And you can see how vastly different these two regions of the urethra look. And your spongy urethra is pseudostratified columnar epithelium, except for the terminal portion, which is stratified squamous epithelium, and it contains erectile bodies. And you can see the, the a main difference between the different sections of the urethra is your transitional epithelium versus your pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And then you can also find the different glands depending on what section you're in at these sites. And then for a quick internal female 
uh, reproductive anatomy review. Your internal female st structures are your ovary, your fallopian tube, which can also be referred to as your ovarian tube or your oviduct, your uterus, and your vagina. And I wanted to give just a quick overview of the uterine cycle because that does influence what you see histologically. So your uterine cycle consists of three main phases, your menstrual, proliferative, and secretory phases. And during menstruation, the uterus sheds its inner lining, which then gives rise to the proliferative phase where the lining thickens to prepare for a potential pregnancy. And if pregnancy doesn't occur, the secretary phase follows. And this is where the lining becomes more vascularized to support a fertilized egg. And then if no pregnancy happens, the cycle will repeat itself. And in knowing the general steps of folliculogenesis, which is the maturation of an ovarian follicle, is really important to help understand the histology of um, the ovaries. So you have six steps that are depicted here in this image really nicely. You have your menstruation, the follicle development, maturation of the follicle, ovulation, the building of the corpus luteum, and then the deterioration of the corpus luteum. And so for our ovary, you have four layers histologically. So your first layer, which is outlined here in blue, is your germinal epithelium, which is a simple squamous to cuboidal epithelium that completely envelops the ovary. So this is kind of your outer covering. And then below your germinal epithelium, you have your capsule, which is known as your tunica albuginea, which is a fibrous and collapsed collagenous layer that protects these deeper ovarian structures, which you can see below. Next, you would come to the cortex, which is where ovarian follicles containing eggs are located, as well as some connective tissues. And then the innermost structure is your medulla, which is a loose fibroelastic tissue that is highly vascularized to provide nourishment to these surrounding tissues. And then over here on the left, you can also see your outer germinal epithelium, your tunica albuginea, and then your cortex. And so in this cortex, you can identify follicles in various stages of development, which is really neat to see histologically, but it is important to point out that you guys will not need to distinguish the stage of follicular development for the, your anatomy exam. Now, going to the uterus, the uterus has three layers. So as Kate covered in your first session, you can see that the uterus lies between the bladder and the rectum. And then if you come down here, this figure has a good breakdown of all of the different structures within the uterus, specifically highlighting the three different layers that we're about to go over histologically. So moving from the exterior of the uterus to the inside of the uterus, we start with the perimetrium, which is a serous layer that protects the uterus from friction. And it's considered part of the peritoneum and it is made up of mesothelium and a loose connective tissue. And then next we have our myometrium, which is our middle layer and our most muscular layer. Um, so myo, you can equate over to muscle and this is the muscular layer that functions to expand in pregnancy and contract during childbirth. And it's composed of three layers of vascularized smooth muscle and loose irregular connective tissue, collagen, and elastic fibers that lie between your layers. And this is a really nice histological representation of how different the endometrium and the myometrium look um, when in a slice together. And then finally, most inside or butting up against uh, the most internal structure of the uterus is our endometrium, which is the inner layer that functions as the implantation for a fertilized egg. So should an egg be fertilized and an embryo to grow, this is where things would be uh, up against. And it is a simple columnar epithelium with a mucous membrane. And now the endometrium has two main la layers to it. 
which you have a functional layer and a basal layer and your functional layer changes in thickness during the menstrual cycle and sheds during menstruation. And then your basal layer is a relatively constant thickness. And this is what helps the functional, functional layer regenerate during each menstrual cycle. And then up here, you can see this just histologically points out how the endometrium can look very, very different during the different stages of the uterine cycle. And then uh, like was covered in our first session, um, the path that the sperm takes is uh, the testes to the epididymis, to the vas deferens, into the ejaculatory duct, and into the urethra. So we are going to go ahead and jump into some histology of the testes. So just like the capsule of the ovary, uh, the testes also have a tunica albuginea, which protects the underlying structures and is made of fibroblasts and collagen fibers. And you can see that nicely here. Then you also have Leydig cells and the Leydig cells predominant function is they produce testosterone, which is the hormone that promotes sperm production. And then you also have these seminiferous tubules and their responsibility is to produce sperm through spermatogenesis. And so these um, seminiferous tubules are made up of an epithelium that contains Sertoli cells, which envelop and support sperm at various stages of their development. And this is just a very brief uh, figure that shows uh, how sperm go from a spermatogonium to the actual spermatozoa that does fertilization. And then here, histologically, you can see the differentiation between spermatids, spermatocytes, spermatozoa, and then these Sertoli cells, which help envelop and support the sperm. And then we also thought it would be a great idea to give you guys uh, kind of a fun little review um, at the end here. So this is uh, a good way that you can kind of uh, test yourself and see uh, with matching the structure and the function. So if somebody wants to, I don't know the best way to do this. If you guys would like to put in the chat what you think A's uh, function is, or if somebody wants to call it out, um, that would be that would be great. Perfect. So yes, Michael, yes, A is three. So it uh, is the epithelial structure that is the site for sperm production. And then C is one, yes. And then B is two. So B is the protective layer of the ovary. And then C makes up the mucosal layer to accommodate changes in volume. So great job, guys. And that brings us to the end of the PowerPoint. Thank you, Mackenzie. Um, I just wanted to say that last kind of exercise is a good way to differentiate between things. Um, that you guys should be trying to do with the new histology atlas that's on our website. If you haven't taken a look at that, uh, for one of our awesome Drexel University students. Um, so I would try to look at them in relation to each other because it could be a little disorienting if you're taking an exam for the first time and you haven't looked at how these look. Jumping from one question to the next, you're going to see a lot of histological images. So um, kind of that last exercise is something that I would practice doing on your own as well. Do we have any questions for Mackenzie? Um, yeah, I had one. Um, I know you have all your uh, immature eggs before you're born, but where is that actually stored? I assume it's in the ovary, but is it like in the medulla part of the ovary where that, I thought there was vascularization there. Um, how is it protected? and? kept alive kind of there and how's it activated for like yeah like where 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 are they stored for the most part 
Dr. Peterson, would you like to uh, take that? Yeah, yeah, um, of course. If you can go back to the ovary slide, Mackenzie, maybe we can yes. tag team it a little bit. So I don't know if this will be all that clear, but let's focus, Mackenzie, since you have the cursor um, on that, just the very outermost, just deep to number two, which is the tunica, tunica albuginea. If you, if you kind of focus in on that, all of you, Michael especially, so th this is wild, and I love this terminology. So those immature eggs that we're born with are much, much smaller until each month a handful of them are activated through FSH, which is a hormone coming from the pituitary gland. But they're in little groupings, and so they're oftentimes referred to as a nest of egg cells, which is, I mean, that's so cute. It's a little tiny, little eggs in a collection. Um, they're really small, and they're usually in the layer of the cortex that abuts right up to the tunica albuginea. And each month as these eggs um, start to um, differentiate and, and mature, the follicles, the shell of cells around them do as well. So the follicle gets larger and then the follicle actually um, increases in the number of layers of cells surrounding it. And so these tertiary follicles, nice job in, in going to the next slide, Mackenzie, thank you. The tertiary follicles are the mature follicles and you can just see um, they're so much larger in size and you can also get a good sense that the layer, the number of layers of cells in the follicle has also increased. So that was a great question. Thank you. You can also use these as a good demarcation um, histologically for knowing when you're looking at the tunica albuginea versus seeing that transition over to the cortex. Michael, do you uh, have another, another question? Yeah, yeah. Another question I had was, so the follicle, when it um, ex after like ovulation when it explodes it becomes the corpus luteum and then it starts uh, secreting inhibin to stop the follicle, follicle stimulating hormone and then progesterone but um, I assume that progesterone uh, promotes like the endometrial basal cells to start building up endometrium but um, how does it travel does it travel to the uterus like how does it not break down when there is an implantation versus if there's no implantation, it does end up breaking down. Okay. Kenzie, you want to take that one or do you want me to? Um, if we can kind of tag team it, if you, <laughs> um, so I think you, Michael, I think you may have kind of answered, answered your question in explaining your knowledge behind it. So there's these very complex, um, hormone positive and negative feedback systems that uh, promote or inhibit the release of these hormones. And if I'm understanding what you're asking, you're asking what happens with progesterone uh, and the endometrium when it either sheds or proliferates to support the egg growing. Um, so you have your FSH and your inhibin, and then when your progesterone comes in. So if there is not fertilization of an egg, then there's no activating signal for your progesterone. And then your endometrium, that's when it would go through its cycle and then would sloth off at the end. Dr. Peterson, is there anything else or a little bit more clarifying there? Right. I guess I would just um, say sort of to reinforce what Mackenzie just said, if implantation does occur, it's really almost so fertilization occurs. It takes a week. This is all from earlier tutoring sessions, almost a week for that developing embryo now to float down the oviduct and arrive at the, the, the lumen, the cavity of the uterus. Once it implants, almost immediately after that, there are cells that start to produce an embryonic hormone, which all of you will probably recognize, which is HCG. So human choreo, choreo, 
gonadotrophic or gonadotrophic hormone, which is what is actually being um, tested for in a urine pregnancy test. So that sort of is a redundant and reinforcing hormone produced by cells of the embryo along with the corpus luteum. So the two reinforce each other so that there's continual progesterone production during early pregnancy, just to maintain that uterine lining. And if implantation doesn't occur, then the corpus luteum will actually start to degenerate and it just becomes scar tissue. So the older a woman is, the more um, ovulation she's had each month, the more of these they're called atretic follicles that, that are in the ovary and also scar tissue on the, on the actual capsule, which a lot of people surmise is contributing factors to why it becomes more and more difficult for um, older women to actually ovulate and become pregnant. Probably way more than you wanted to know, Michael. <laughs> Uh, no, that was perfect. Um, so, so the the follicle or the corpus luteum never actually leaves the uterus. So the follicle, remember, the corpus luteum is in the ovary, and it's just producing a hormone that moves into the blood vessels in the medulla. And so maybe Mackenzie can just show you those blood vessels right there in the core of the ovary. So the cells are producing progesterone, it moves into the bloodstream and is circulated, it doesn't have very far to go, is circulated to cells in the endometrial lining. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, perfect, thank you. Sorry, I, I also misspoke. I'm at, I'm at the ovary, not the uterus. Yeah, thank exactly, you. exactly, of course. Okay. Do we have any other questions for Mackenzie? Uh, seeing none, then uh, okay. I guess Mackenzie, you are you are. Uh... Oh, Michael's got one more question. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I actually no problem. I almost missed it. <laughs> could you um? Could you briefly explain the? You mentioned like the balloon cell. Uh, in the bladder would tell us like when it's compressed versus uncompressed. Would you explain like a little uh, how we differentiate between the balloon cell and the flattened? What is that? Is it just called French onion soup? Mm -hmm. or so you can kind of see here in these images. Um, I couldn't find, there wasn't a great image of stress of stretched transitional epithelium. Um, compared to unstretched, but I do think that these two images do a decent job at kind of giving that differentiation. And a approach that I like to take when looking at different histological images, and the more histology you look at, you'll kind of be able to uh, pinpoint certain characteristics about different cells and different tissue types that'll help you differentiate them. Um, but here with these balloon cells, so you can see that they're on this outer most layer. And from this image, they seem to kind of have smaller, more eth sorry, uh, more eccentric nuclei, which when you look over here to see the, your stretched transitional epithelium, these larger cells are a couple layers below your top layer and they have much more larger and concentric nuclei so that's probably how i would go about trying to tell the difference between them using the size and kind of location of the nuclei uh, but if uh, dr peterson has kind of a better way to differentiate them uh, would love to hear it so again maybe uh, mackenzie if you'll just you know be my first remover for me. So on that far right hand image, the cells closest to the lumen, um, when it's not stretched, um, can round up. So their cytoplasm is really um, circulating all around the nucleus of those cells. 
as the, as the bladder fills, there are proteins that form a kind of flattened disc. They're called uh, uroplacans. And when, the, when that happens, when the bladder fills, these proteins form these plaque-like discs, and that's what flattens those balloon cells out. So over in that middle image, the cells that are closest to the white space, which is the lumen, those flattened cells are, that are stretched way out with their cytoplasm, those are the flattened balloon cells. That's kind of a cool, cool thing that happens just with you know hydrodynamics and fluid pressure on those balloon cells that those proteins form those plaques. Another very cool thing about the human body. Um, another thing too is that this. Um... I think the main takeaway from this slide is um, to just really not get confused with the unstretched transitional epithelium versus the stratified squamous. And part of that just goes back to looking at the meaning of these things. And so squamous, again, we're talking about a flattened outer layer versus when you look at the unstretched, you can see it's very much not that. Those balloon cells are very obviously the outermost layer. They're not flattened. Um, so even though it's uh, it's very stratified here and they can look very similar, if you look at that outer layer and pay attention to that, that should key you in uh, to getting the right answer on the exam. Uh, sorry, by e eccentric nucleus, you meant like it's kind of like smaller, more flat. Um, and and not necessarily uh, centralized. It's more uh, kind of up in one corner, whereas over here, they're more centralized. I don't think I see any other questions. And if there are none, now you can <laughs> be finished. Thank you again, Mackenzie. Thank you. Uh, another excellent uh, presentation. And thank you again from everyone at Anatomy for all of your help. Um, of course. And uh, appreciate it very much. All right. So they saved the best for last, right? <laughs> Okay, well, our third presenter this evening, um, and uh, Tony, I believe this is your first presentation, is it? Yes, so please welcome uh, Tony Gagne, and we actually should call him Dr. Tony Gagne. He's a doctor of chiropractic. Um, Tony grew up on the beach of Cape Canaveral on Florida's east coast. For his bachelor's degree, he studied exercise science at Florida Atlantic University. He then completed a master's in sports health science and a doctorate in chiropractic at Life University in Atlanta, Georgia. He is currently in his second year of medical school at VCOM Auburn, Alabama. He aspires to become a family medicine physician with specialization in sports medicine. You can usually find Tony playing sports, being active outdoors, and looking for the next big adrenaline rush like skydiving or scuba diving. How about yeah, doing it? Yeah. How about another rush of doing a tutoring session? It's all it's all the same. The adrenaline is all the same. The, well, the floor is yours, and please share your um, presentation with us. Uh, let me know it with the thumbs up if you can see. All right. Can we see everything? Let's do like that. Are we good? All right. So I will try to keep up with the brilliant presenters that went before me. Uh, I, I was taking notes myself because they have been awesome. And um, we're going to I really like embryology. Uh, embryology is kind of like how, where everything that they've been over so far, it's where it comes from. And so you can learn a lot about uh, what you learned just now. You can learn even more just understanding where it comes from. So without further ado, let's see if we can get it. There we go. Okay. So we have a little, a few lecture objectives, objectives here. 
Uh, I separated them into what we're going to be talking about with urinary and reproductive systems and then the placenta and fetal membrane. So first thing we're going to go over, explain the formation of the male reproductive organs. That's going to include the testes, the genital ducts, the seminal vesicle, the prostate, penis, and scrotum. Then we're going to go ahead we're going to do the same thing. We're going to explain uh, the formation of the female reproductive organs. That's going to include ovary, uterine tubes, uterus, vagina, labia, and clitoris. Number three, we're going to compare the development of the mesonephric and the metanephric kidneys from the intermediate mesoderm. And then to round off that, we will explain the formation of the nephron in the collecting system. And then as we move on from that, we're going to jump to the placenta and the fetal membranes, where we will describe the extra embryonic membranes, which include amnion, chorion, yolk sac, and help me with the pronunciation, I believe it's the allantois, I believe. Um, and so then we'll describe the development and function of the placenta. And let's do this. There we go. Okay. So what I want to do here as we go through these slides is I, most of these slides, as I go forward real quick, you'll see the same pictures. Okay. As we go through, and I'm going to hope, hopefully we can try to build just an idea of how this whole embryogenesis works. And so when we start, if you look at the top of the screen, we're talking about the male reproductive system. And we're talking about the testes here, the gonads differentiating into the testes. So when we start, we're starting with the development and we start as this undifferentiated uh, fetus or undifferentiated, um, whatever you want to call it. And so that's what we're looking at here with the Mullerian ducts, the genital ridge, the mesonephrus, Wolfian ducts, and we'll get into all of that. But this structure right here is where all of that is going to come from. And this right now is undifferentiated. So so how do we get testes or how do we get the ovaries and everything that we've talked about, where does it all come from? It starts here with this undifferentiated um, tissue. And then what's going to happen is Right here, if you're looking at Y, where does it come from? Why does it come from? It's the Y chromosome. When that is present, when the DNA from mom and dad come together and make this fetus, when there's a Y chromosome present, this undifferentiated mass here is going to turn into or is going to turn into eventually a uh, testes and lead to male development. So again, mom, dad come together, we get the DNA, we get a Y chromosome from our father and the presence of the Y chromosome that has the SRY gene on it, the gene is a part of the chromosome. These two things, the Y chromosome with the SRY gene is gonna lead to this whole cascade from this one undifferentiated thing into testes. So that's where the testes come from, okay? And then this is further down into the uh, cascade and everything we go to and we're gonna pick up on all of this. So after we have the testes formed, um, we're still in the developing fetus. This is all happening about uh, around week six or seven of development. The testes, since they have been differentiated from the Y chromosome and the SRY gene, because we have that now, the testes are going to start secreting, specifically the Sertoli cells here. The Sertoli cells in the testes are going to begin secreting anti-mullerian hormone, or AMH for short. And so if we go back to this picture in the top right, this was our undifferentiated thing, uh, tissue, and it, we have all this undifferentiated tissue, we have more of it. What you're looking at is Mullerian duct here and a Wolfian duct here. And we have both of these when this tissue is undifferentiated. Now a Y chromosome with the SRY gene enters the picture. We have these undifferentiated gonads turn into testes. Testes make Sertoli cells. Sertoli cells are gonna secrete AMH anti-Mullerian hormone, and the anti-Mullerian hormone is going to degenerate Mullerian, the Mullerian ducts. Remember I said up in the top here, we start with both Wolfian duct and the Mullerian duct, and when we get their Sertoli cells in the testes, anti-Mullerian hormone is going to degenerate Mullerian ducts, and this is when we have, that leaves the Wolfian duct. Remember, we're talking about male uh, reproductive formation here. When the Wolfian duct stays and the anti-Mullerian hormone from the Sertoli cells in the testes degenerates the Mullerian ducts, that's going to lead to the uh, that's going to lead to the formation of the genital ducts in the male. Follow, follow so far, and the genital ducts 
are going to include the epididymis that we talked about earlier, the seminal vesicle, the ejaculatory ducts, as well as the vas deferens. And down here in this is just a, a picture of what we're talking about. This is another version of this picture. Bottom left is the same as the top right here. This is our uh, testes or undifferentiated gonads. And right here is the Wolfian duct or the mesonephric duct that we've been talking about. Okay. So as we move along, Sertoli cells have now degenerated the, the Mullerian ducts. We have the anti-Mullerian hormone coming from Sertoli cells. The seminal vesicle, which is what we talked about earlier, uh, is going to come from the distal portion of the Wolfian ducts. The Wolfian ducts are also known as the uh, mesonephric ducts. I believe that's shown, yes, right here, the Wolfian uh, duct with the mesonephric duct there. So the Wolfian ducts are going to, now this is all happening a few weeks notice, a few weeks later. So as things are developing, it takes time to do so. And so now beginning around week 10, we have the seminal vesicles. Distal portion of the Wolfian ducts just means it's farther down the line, like literally farther down the line in the body. It's distal, um, further away from center. And so as things move down and things begin progressing, here we have seminal vesicles in this picture here. And um, the why is the important part here. So as the testes are formed, the Sertoli cells are making this AMH, degenerates Mullerian. The Leydig, cell, the Leydig cells, if I uh, pronounce that correctly, is generating testosterone. And now this testosterone that has been uh, generated from the testes and the Leydig cells are going, the testosterone is going to induce the seminal vesicle formation. So we go from Y chromosome, SRY gene, testes, then we go to the genital, uh, the, the genital uh, tubes and now seminal vesicles all coming from AMH, testosterone, Leydig cells, Sertoli cells, trying to build this big picture of how this is all coming together and how it all builds into that, those finished products that we learned about earlier. So prostate again. Now the prostate is going to be formed from the urogenital sinus. This is different than what we've been talking about so far. So far, we've been learning for, about the Wolfian duct, the mesonephric duct. Now the prostate formation, This and this is important for understanding because we're in different anatomy now. So it's still the male reproductive system, but this prostate formation comes from urogenital sinus, still around week 10. And this comes from the prostate formation comes from testosterone and namely dihydrotestosterone, DHT, which is a just another form of testosterone or a different version that uh, it comes from testosterone enzymatically produced. And that's going to in introduce um, the prostate as well. Uh, and doctors, feel free to step in uh, if I'm going too fast or if I miss anything, please stop me and help me out. But um, so that's the whole picture so far as we're going through this, right? Prostate formation. And as I pointed out uh, in the last slide there with the prostate formation, the penis and scrotum are also going to form from the urogenital sinus. Now, this is a different picture. I really like this picture a lot because this is going to show the, the similarities of the embryological, uh, the center, the embryological beginning in the male and the female as we go over both the male and the female um, uh, fertilization and, and production and whatnot. And so let's just find here, if you can find my cursor right here, urogenital sinus is what we're talking about, forming the penis and the scrotum. Here we have the Mullerian duct and the uh, Mullerian tubercle. Urogenital sinus is here, right? And so this is very distal, again, very away from center, further down the line. Uh, and this is where DHT, the androgen receptors, which DHT attaches to, are going to play and create the penis and scrotum. And you'll see it develop and you'll see we'll have the external genitalia. This, the genital, genital tubercle, urethral flow, uh, fold, labial scrotal swelling, all of this in the male here and the female here. This is the view that you're going to see the similarities because we have the urethral folds here the labial, scroll, labial scrotal swelling on the outside and on the outside of both geni genital tubercle. And you'll see how all of that comes down in the male and the female and where it all comes from. And this is the cool part about embryology, I think. This is where you can start making those connections and 
you go, oh my gosh, that's the same, That, but this is how it turns here, and this is where it goes left, this is where it goes right, but it all starts right here. So that should wrap us up for the mail. Uh, I added this, just, this is a great, just a great video for timeline. So we were talking about it starts, everything starts around week seven, week six or seven. And then as we get to uh, the penis scrotum, external genitalia and the prostate, we were talking about week 10. So there's a good idea of um, the timeline. And then here's the Y chromosome and how everything Sertoli cells, AMH degenerates this, testosterone and the Wolfian ducts are going to help build all of that. Okay, just another way to look at it. Okay, so let's move on to the female. Gonads differentiate into ovaries now. So we're back here. We're back to undifferentiated gonads. We're back to uh, both Mullerian ducts and Wolfian ducts because this is where it all starts. We're back to week seven. We're back into the developing fetus. This time, there is the absence of a Y chromosome. There is no Y, which means there's no SRY gene. And so because there's no Y, uh, chromosome, there's no SRY gene to create the testes and the, and the, um, the, I'm blanking on it right now. Uh, whatever that hormone was. Uh, oh, anti-Malarian, of course it's right in the name. And so what's going to happen here is the Mullerian ducts are going to persist. These are going to stay. And because of that, uh, these will, uh, the Wolfian duct will degenerate and we will begin our path. This is where instead of going left, going right, we will begin to uh, develop the female reproductive uh, organs. And that's, again, same as before, week six or seven. And it's because of specifically the absence of the Y chromosome. What's in the absence of the Y chromosome? It's another X chromosome, right? So without that Y, we have two Xs and we begin the process of female reproductive organs. Okay, uterine tube formation. Uh, this is the upper portion. Oops, sorry about that. The upper portion of the Mullerian ducts, still around week seven, Mullerian ducts is persisting. And so if you can think of the parallels, this would be the same as the uh, Wolfian ducts that we were talking about earlier, way at the front here, the this part. So the Wolfian duct formation with the male genital ducts, right, epididymis, all of that, the female equivalent here, is just the same, except for we've gone right instead of left, no SRY gene, no Y chromosome. So the ovary, the oviducts that we've talked about earlier, the fallopian tube, the uterine tube, as it's called as well, ovarian tube, all of these things, this is the female equivalent here. And that's simply because the Mullerian duct has persisted, right? And so we're going to get the uterine and fallopian tubes. We're also going to get the uterus from this as well, and the upper one-third of the vagina. The lower two-thirds of the vagina is going to come from the urogenital sinus, which is the equivalent of the prostate that we've talked about already. So again, just the big picture of how this is differentiating and why it's differentiating into what it is. For uterine tube formation, the lower portion of the malarian duct and the upper portion of the genital urinary sinus now we've noticed week 10, we have moved into week 10 now, just like we did in the prostate. And then we're going to begin the external genitalia and the lower portion of the Mullerian ducts are going to begin to fuse. Same thing, this picture is the same as the, has been on the previous slides, except for we're just highlighting the Mullerian or the paramesomephric ducts here. So far, so good. Okay, so let's move on to comparing the development of the mesonephric duct, right? And the uh, intermediate mesoderm, mesonephric, mesonephric and metanephric comparisons. So this is happening around early week six. We are talking about mesonephric, which was that Wolfian duct, is gonna create the uteric, uteric bud, the ureters and the genital ducts in males, and the metanephros, kidney and ureter. So what are we looking at here? The metanephros says all of this is going on. This is what we were looking at earlier in the fetus. As the fetus is developing here, these tissues are differentiating and things are, hormones are acting on receptors. What you're going to get is the mesonephric duct is going to become here and form the reproductive organs that we've talked about already. And down here, the metanephros is going to help to begin form the kidney, kidney and ureter. And so as the kidney and the reproductive organs are different, they, they might start similar or they might start the same. This is where they begin to differentiate in their formation. And so mesonephric, you should be thinking Wolfian. 
and you should be thinking genital ducts, right? And metanephric, metanephric comparisons, we should be thinking kidney and ureter, uh, urinary system versus reproductive system, okay? So as for the nephron and the collecting system, that ure ureteric bud that we've talked about differentiates into the mature nephrons and the collecting system. Collecting system is going to be this, ureter, renal pelvis, major calluses, minor, collecting ducts, collecting tubes. And here is a wonderful diagram that you can start picking out all the different parts. Mesonephric duct that we were talking about and the ureteric bud is going to come off of that mesonephric duct. Ureteric bud branches off. The metanephric mesenchyme, mesenchyme is just a fancy name for tissue, if I remember correctly. Metanephric tissue is going to uh, form that kidney proper with the mature nephrons collecting system. And the ureteric bud is going to come off the mesonephric duct. That's the important part here. And these two systems, kidney, ureter, and reproductive and it's going to eventually become this right here. And this is what we've learned about so far already with the ureter into the bladder, kidney proper here, right? Okay. So let's talk about uh, some membranes and some supply to the fetus after implantation and whatnot. So extra embryonic membranes here, the amnion the thin protective membrane that forms a fluid-filled cavity, which is the amniotic cavity, around the embryo. I think this is day eight, amnion cavity begins to form. So it's happening pretty early. Um, what's important here on this side, this big, uh, this big picture on the right side of the screen here, this is, where it, this is how it begins. Uh, this is very early. And what we're looking at here is this light teal, like blue-green teal here. This is the amnion, this is the layer of cells that are the amnion, and this here is the cavity. And if you come over to this picture on this side, it's still the same color, this teal here, you'll see how this cavity fills up. And what's probably important to note here is that the amnion itself is still this thin membrane. When, when anybody mentions amnion, specifically to talking about that membrane, because the membrane, the outside of that membrane, forms a cavity. And the cavity, the amniotic cavity, is where the fetus, the baby, is going to be suspended in amniotic fluid. So the amnion is the membrane, the fluid is in the cavity, and the fetus floats in the amniotic cavity in the amniotic fluid. It was a lot of amnion. I hope we understand that. Okay. Then the chorion is the outermost membrane, the outermost membrane surrounding all the other membranes. Um, so this develops from the trophoblast cells and the mesoderm. It helps with nutrient transfer. This is a, a few days later. But what I want to show you here is the chorion. Come over to, there it is. This is where it starts. Chorion is the outermost membrane surrounding all the other membranes, develops from the trophoblast cells. So if you're thinking, chorion, what's the difference between the chorion and the amnion? Chorion trophoblast, which is these cells here that help with implantation, and it's the outermost membrane. So let's go to this where it's a little more developed. What we're going to find is the chorion is this yellow membrane right here, right here, chorion. Oh, there we go. The chorion, this here and here, chorion membrane. So it's going to be the chorion, I think the big picture for understanding the chorion, it's the outermost. It holds everything. Okay. Good on that. And let's see, did it show the chorion here? Yes, of course. Okay. For the yolk sac, we're even earlier. Pay attention to the time. Yolk sac is very, very early, very early. And the function of the yolk sac is to provide early red blood cell production for the embryo. Because it's got to get the blood cells from somewhere to start. And what we're doing here is the yolk sac is this part. It went, remember this blue was the, or teal as, as it was earlier, was amniotic. This is the amnion. The, am, the membrane is the amnion. The cavity is the amniotic cavity. Here, the yolk sac is going to help provide early red blood cells to that developing fetus. Okay. And the yolk sac here is right here in this picture. And as the fetus grows, 
this, this function starts to drop off as the uh, fetus is able to grow and become more independent on its own. The yolk sac's function will drop off, but its main function is to provide the early red blood cells to the, to the fetus there. The allantois, make sure I say that right. I, I studied all week just to say that correctly. The function is early waste removal, and it's eventually going to become incorporated into the umbilical cord. Okay, and so the allantois here, as you can see, is connected to the trophoblast and the um, and the chorion. So it will eventually become the uh, uh, integrate with the umbilical cord, and it's helpful for nutrient transfer. And here, so uh, for this picture, this is very early, very early picture. This is a little later in development. This here is going to be the body stock and the allantois. And all of this is going to combine into the um, umbilical cord. And all of this here together is providing nutrients to the developing fetus. Let's see here. For the placenta, um, after implantation, again, early day six or 10, this is pretty much developing uh, pretty early. It's going to be supplying the uh, nutrients and the O2, the, the oxygen and removing waste. What I wanted to show you, this is a fantastic picture of the placenta. This placenta is, um, I, did, I did a little research, let's see here in my notes. Placenta is Latin in, in the etymology, like where words come from. It's Latin and German, placenta means cake. And in Greek, it means flat or slab-like. So flat slab-like cake is what the, the old Greek, Latin, German word placenta means. And you can see that really well here, I think on this picture. This is how it develops uh, from the trophoblast layer of cells. And then this flat cake-like layer, I don't know, cake to me makes sense because it provides a lot of nutrients. I like cake, I think it provides me nutrients. So placenta providing the fetus nutrients works out for me and it is flat like that right there. And so again, it's gonna come, this picture is here to show you that it show, the uh, placenta is gonna begin developing with all of this and all of these things, structures here in this area are to, provide for the, the fetus and the uh, development as well. Let's see. So I know that was a lot. I know that was really quick. It's been a long uh, session. And so let's just summarize real quick. The, the big picture here that we, we've been talking about for embryology of these reproductive systems and whatnot, the undifferentiated gonads are going to respond to hormones to determine the reproductive organ development. So we're talking about anti-malarian hormone. We're talking about testosterone. We're talking about the Y gene and the SRY and whatnot. That's going to help develop the testes. And then the three main players that we talked about for that, Wolfian or the mesonephric ducts, that's for the males, right? The malarian or the uh, paramesonephric ducts female reproductive organs, urogenital sinus for both, but different structures. And then the membranes, make sure we know the difference between the chorion and the amnion. Amnion's inner with the fetus, chorion's the outermost one, yolk sac, allantois, and the placenta are all gonna help that fetus develop with uh, nutrients and waste removal and all of those things. So that's the difference. These are membranes, these help supply, and all of these work together for everything. Let's see, that's the, your lecture objectives. Hopefully if you read through this, I don't wanna take up too much time so we don't go over, but if you're reading through this again, maybe we have a better idea of where the reproductive organs come from when we're talking about testes, seminal vesicles, prostate, you, ovary and the uterus and vagina and everything like that, okay? These are my references. Doctors help me out with any questions if there are any. I do you have one question. When does the Atlantis form the allantois let's go back to it so when does that form the allantois i believe uh if uh, any of the doctors want to help me out i believe it forms early with the yolk sac um but if if we can get confirmation on that for me you can and yes and i think um really you did a great job tony and we'll just um in case students do some extra research wikipedia you know asking google there's actually two yolk sacs that form so that's kind of goofy so you might see in some other resources where they talk about the primary and then the secondary yolk sac so the primary yolk sac forms really early on from the layer of cells um, 
Remember we talked about the bilaminar disc. You know, that's in week two of embryo embryonic development, the bilaminar disc. And those two layers were called, and you can see them here, if Tony highlights those, the epiblast and the hypoblast. So the hypoblast is what really gives rise to the yolk sac. And so even in week two, we're thinking about the developing yolk sac. It's just a hollow shell of cells. And on its surface, some of those cells um, are going to become specialized to perform to, to specialize into red blood cells and white blood cells. So it forms pretty early on. And again, you have the primary yolk sac that forms and then degenerates and then a secondary yolk sac that is there for the rest of the embryonic and then regresses during fetal development. And Tony made a, a, did a nice job of explaining that. What I think we may have lost a little sight of is, and, and I know women who have given birth to children that don't understand this, that the developing embryo is developing within the wall of the uterus. It develops in the endometrial tissue. It is not developing in the cavity of the uterus. And the reason that has to happen is that it relies heavily early on um, before it forms its own heart and blood supply. It relies on gas exchange between that really blood rich um, endometrial lining. And you just really have to understand that before you kind of dive into some of the other details of the development um, a little bit later on of the amnion chorion, which collectively really become the placenta on the surface of the embryo closest to the endometrial tissue. So you can kind of get a sense of that from uh, the images that Tony incorporated on this slide. Yeah, so nice job. Yeah, awesome. thank you, Tony. I thought that was so great. I really appreciate your enthusiasm for embryo. I think it's just so great how you can see how many things um, develop. I did want to add one thing um, to something you said about the uh, mesonephros versus the metanephros, um, in case anyone comes by and they're reading. This is a more advanced lecture objective, so you'll come across this in the regional competition. Um, if you do well in the locals and you advance on, then woohoo. Um, then uh, before that, though, what Tony said, I think, is perfect and all you need to know. But for those of you that might do a little bit of digging in the meantime, uh, the uh, mesonephros is going to um, also play a role in the kidney development for an intermediate kidney that will regress until the adult kidneys actually develop. Um, so that's just something to take note of that you might find in your reading. Um, if you see kind of the the metanephros being the kidney and the ureter and the mesonephros being strictly the uh, reproductive structures, that's true in the adults. But just um, make a mental note that the mesonephros actually will develop an intermediate kidney um, in the beginning there. So um, and with that, I'll leave you with a, a great joke that one of my colleagues told me is that you're actually born with four knees, but two of them develop into or, or sorry, it's uh, four kidneys and two of them develop into adult knees. And that's probably one of my favorite anatomy jokes I've heard so far from courtesy of Dr. Colley. Thank you, Tony. Note to, note to self on that one. <laughs> that's a dad joke there. <laughs> Michael, do you have a question? Yeah, actually with all like the terminology of regress regression, what do you mean by that as far as like, it just kind of becomes kind of in inactive. Is it like developing during that time? And then um, what does it come back? Like, what does it do when it comes back? Or does it just kind of sit there and then degrade? Sure. So if, um, if I understand correctly, so the mesonephros, when we're talking about regression, the kidney does this really cool thing when it's developing. It starts down low here. And then as you see in this slide, it starts, it, it ends up way higher right here. You see the difference. Uh, yes, sir, Dr. Frank. Oh, good. Okay. So yeah, yeah. So it goes, it, it's going to start a little lower here. Notice the, the, this obviously isn't a scale, um, but the, the distance here, 
And then in, in the distance here, the kidney actually ascends. Does it, It's one of the coolest things in embryology because as it is, ascends, the artery supplying it is going to disintegrate and then jump up back to it and disintegrate. And it's this really cool travel. And so what we mean by regression, back to your question, is as this is here, the regression of the mesonephros, as it matures, this kidney, this metanephric tissue is going to go up and this is going to come down and de uh I want to say not disintegrate, um, but degenerate. And is that the correct terminology that this uh, regret, this is going to degenerate as this ascends? Is that, can we say regression and degeneration together? As long as it's clear that this is a controlled um, loss of cells. And so there's no tissue damage, there's no inflammation, et cetera. So it's a, a, a process that would be similar to what we've um, helped the um, anatomy students know as apoptosis. Cool. Yep. Totally planned. And, the, and I, I just think, I think, uh, I can't believe I skipped over that so fast. I think it's one of the coolest things uh, in the embry embryology is as the traveling, the kidney, how it travels up. And, and it does this all planned motion and, and, and becomes the anatomy that it is. It's the, I, I really like it. I'm glad you asked that question. And what's really neat, you will see in the gross lab where uh, sometimes there will be ectopic kidneys because they fail to ascend. Uh, you can even see uh, a condition where the two kidneys join uh, and form a horseshoe kidney. Um, so, uh, that, that migration is, is very important. And if that gets messed up, we can see some anatomical, uh, variations, which is what I like. Anatomy is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Do we have any other questions? I think we're all set. Yeah. Dr. Gagne, thank you very much. Thank you all for having me. For that ex uh, excellent presentation. This is so cool that everybody's here and doing this. I Anatomy was my favorite. A subject in high school. I don't even know if I would have been brave enough to enter in a national competition. Uh, everybody <laughs> doing something like this. I'm so, so excited to see everybody here and learning on a Sunday night doing this. It's amazing. It's so cool. I appreciate you guys having me. And I'm really proud of everybody doing this because this is awesome. Good for you. I don't know if I could have done it, but you guys are awesome. Thank you doctors too, for helping out. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. I really appreciate that. Um, and yeah, thank you, everybody. So with that, um, I don't think I could say anything better than how he just ended it. So I'll just remind you all that the next tutoring session is two weeks from today. And uh, you'll learn more about kind of a modge podge of stuff between head and neck and um, some immune system functions to really wrap everything up nicely. And then we'll finish that off with the review session two weeks after that before the competition. So looking forward to everybody joining us. If Dr. Peterson has any other closing remarks. Just to remind all of you what um, Dr. Pascura uh, said at the beginning, which is the last final day to have any of your friends, classmates register for the anatomy is February the 12th, and that's a Monday night at midnight. So get her done. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye, everyone.